Um, now for this coming Sunday, June the 28th, I want to let you know that we're going to have a special presentation from Ken Ham. He is the president and co-founder of Answers in Genesis, which is an apologetics ministry upholding the authority of the Bible from the first verse. He's the visionary behind the popular uh, high-tech creation museum, which has had millions of visitors since an inception. He's also the visionary behind the Ark Encounter, which is a uh, real-life, a uh, full-sized replica of uh, Noah's Ark. And he has authored numerous books which defend the biblical creation account. He, uh, this weekend, will be, well, we're partnering with Answers in Genesis this weekend to bring the sermon to multiple churches across Canada, including our own. And so the sermon is called, going to be called, Why the Catastrophic Spiritual and Moral Change. So just check back into our YouTube channel on Sunday morning at 1030 to watch this message. And I trust that this message will challenge you, equip you, and encourage you. So until then, may God bless you. Hi, I'm Ken Ham, CEO of Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum, and the Ark Encounter, speaking to you from Legacy Hall here at the Creation Museum. And I'm especially speaking to our friends there in Canada, uh, the great country uh, to the north of the United States. A lot of people from Canada actually come down and visit it here, here at Answers in Genesis because they visit the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. So let me just show you a very short little video that just gives you a little tiny taste of the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. <laughs> These are the two leading Christian-themed attractions in the world, and I encourage uh, all of our friends there in Canada to make their way down to northern Kentucky and visit these two attractions. We've added a lot of new exhibits actually at both places, and we continue to do that. Well, I want to talk about the state of the church and the state of the nation. I'm going to look at the spiritual decline we see actually in the entire West and the moral decline. Let's think about the state of the church in Canada. Just very quickly, rates of attendance at religious services have dropped significantly in Canada in recent decades. And from 70% attendance down to 10% in 70 years. So there's no doubt we've seen an exodus from the church in Canada. Now, this has also happened in the United States as well. In fact, a number of years ago, I wrote a book called Already Gone. We had America's research group go out and do research on the church uh, in America to find out why two-thirds of young people are leaving the church by college age and very few returning. And actually, that's happening in Canada. It's happening in Australia, in the United Kingdom. It's happening all over the West. And I believe it's for the same reasons. And what we found out was that basically they weren't taught apologetics, weren't taught to defend their faith. They weren't taught answers to the skeptical questions because of what they were taught at school, in the government education system, or from the media that caused them to doubt that you can trust the Bible, particularly in Genesis. They had questions about Noah's Ark and how Noah could fit all the animals on the Ark and how do you know there's a God and where did God come from? How can you trust the Bible because of science and so on? And that, well, that's indicative of what I find anywhere in the world where I have traveled in these days, that the younger generations think that science has disproved the Bible. And so we see that 
what happened created doubt and that doubt led to unbelief and they walked away from the church. And if you look at church attendance in the United States, which has been, I believe, the greatest Christianized nation in our Western world, even though you know we've seen the Christian worldview or Christianized worldview permeate the entire West, if you have a look here, the greatest generation, those born before 1928, 56% went to church. The silent generation, uh, those born 28 to 45, 44% to church. The boomers, 46 to 64, they were born 32% uh, to church. Generation X, only 27%. The millennials, 18%. And then Generation Z, uh, the younger generation right now, enter Generation Z between... 1999 and 2015 they were born, the first truly post-Christian generation, says George Barner, uh, one of the researchers here, well-known researchers in the Christian world in America. And he found Generation Z are likely to be twice as atheistic as any previous generation. I believe that's true in Canada, it's true in the United Kingdom, it's true in Australia, uh, it's true in our whole Western world. You know, if you look at the United Kingdom, church attendance in Britain from 1980 to 2015, church attendance declined from about 6.5 million to 3 million, equivalent to a decline from 11.8% to 5% of the population. And England has the lowest percentage of the population attending church now at just 4.7%, just below Wales at 4.8% we see this incredible decline. In fact, of the 5.4% in England who go to church on any given Sunday, 42% attend an evangelical church. Therefore, only 2.2% of England could be considered evangelical. Let's look at the state of these nations now. That gives you a little glimpse of the state of the church. The younger generations are walking away from the church. We see this exodus from the church of the younger generations, whether it's Canada, whether it's America, whether it's Australia, whether it's the United Kingdom. Let's look at the state of Canada right now and the state of our Western world. These sort of headlines, this is just a little snippet, just a little sampling of the headlines that we have seen in recent times. Canadian documentary Drag Kids delves into the world of pint-sized drag a Canadian preacher who doesn't believe in God. LGBT activists want to force Catholic schools in Canada to hire teachers in same-sex marriage. Christian parents in Canada see foster application rejected over beliefs on homosexuality and spanking. Transgender bathrooms in Toronto, transgender students in Toronto schools must be accommodated to their own stated gender preference and do not need to produce official documentation to justify their identity choice. A sign at Calgary Airport, does anatomy define gender? Trinity Western loses fight for Christian law school as court rules limits on religious freedom reasonable. Canadian schools cancel Operation Christmas Child over organisations' stance on homosexuality. In other words, the stance of Franklin Graham that marriage is a man and a woman. Ontario minor hockey makes transgender training mandatory for coaches. Canadian MPs give standing ovation to a motion calling for abortion for any reason. A similar sort of thing has happened in America in various places. Canadian churches are being converted into uh, cabarets, record stores and more. And from sacred to secular, Canada set to lose 9,000 churches warns a national heritage group. But they're just a sample of what we've seen. I mean, something catastrophic is happening morally, spiritually in Canada. There's no doubt from a worldview perspective, Canada is becoming less Christian every year. In fact, here's an apt description. I believe it's an apt description of our whole Western world. In Judges 21-25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what is right in his own eyes. You know, when people ask me, what has happened in our Western world? Well, it's very simple. When you take generations of kids and you teach them there's no God and you reject the Bible and you teach against the Bible and you tell them that they just came about by natural processes, by evolutionary naturalism, and therefore you own yourself, you're your own God, so you decide what is right and wrong. When you teach them there is no absolute authority but yourself, then ultimately everyone does what is right in his own eyes. That's really what's happened. The foundation 
of God's word actually gave rise to, you know, the Judeo-Christian worldview that permeated our Western world. It doesn't mean our Western world was, was Christian, but it was very Christianized. But you take away that foundation and put in the foundation, there's no God, man determines truth, then ultimately anything goes. And that's where we're at increasingly in our culture. And this is happening to America, it's happening to the United Kingdom, it's happening to Australia. Let me give you just a sample of news headlines from other nations in our Western world. In the United States, a Democrat blocks Senate banning infanticide after failed abortions. I was just incredible that that happened. Uh, in the United States, this is in Cincinnati. It's not far from the Creation Museum. We're in the Cincinnati area. Drag queen Sparkle Lee brings LGBT story time to a Cincinnati church. In uh, USA, a TED speaker, there are a lot of these TED videos, says pedophilia is a natural sexual orientation. There's been a lot of headlines about pedophilia in recent times. Another one from the United States, abortion activist says we should celebrate abortions like we celebrate babies with baby showers. In Kansas, in the United States, Kansas Library Board divided on whether to let sex offenders present at libraries. And the United States Boy Scouts reversing century-old stance will allow transgender boy, boys. In Britain, this headline here, don't call pregnant women expectant mothers as it might offend transgender people. So they want to use the term pregnant people instead. In the United Kingdom, a UK mum wishes she could have aborted her four-year-old and so sues the government for wrongful birth. In Northern Ireland, gay marriage and abortion legalized and yet they were considered you know, a bastion of Christian worldview for the United uh, kingdom. Uh, Scotland, parents outraged after a man who identifies as a woman assaults 10-year-old daughter in women's bathrooms and just gets a slap on the wrist. In France, mother and father replaced with parent one and parent two in French schools under same-sex amendment. In South Africa, these are other nations to look at what's happening. Doctor faces charges of unprofessional conduct after stating a fetus is a human. In Australia, Australian politician fined an apology demanded two years after complaining about LGBT flag. In Australia, uh, Dr. Death, they call him, creates a live stream service so people can kill themselves while video calling him. And two Australians had already used it by that stage. In Australia, this, is, this one is, is <laughs> terrifying if you think about it. Couples are turning extra IVF embryos, they are human beings, into jewelry. The horror of human embryo jewelry. Also in Australia, Australian judge says incest may no, no longer be taboo. Belgium, children are being euthanized in Belgium. And then what about Disney, known all over the world? People have thought of Disney in the past as family friendly and you know, children could watch their movies and so on. Well, increasingly, Disney is supporting and pushing the LGBTQ worldview. So there's a pride parade at one of its theme parks. And then the Disney XD channel, Star versus the Forces of Evil. Uh, there was a popular cartoon that kids love to watch. Uh, so this one, the first gay kiss. And then the new Beauty, Beauty and the Beast uh, movie is to feature Disney's first exclusively gay moment in a film. And now, just in recent times, Disney that owns Pixar, uh, their short film, Out, features the studio's actually first gay main character. Now, that's just a snippet. We stand back and look at that and, I don't know, are you all depressed? Because <laughs> I feel depressed after uh, looking at all of that. What we're seeing is moral relativism permeating the culture through our whole Western world. Everyone's doing what is right in their own eyes. And, you know, as we think about our children, that are growing up, and our grandchildren growing up in this culture. There's like, like a, a tornado of moral relativism ripping around them. Think about it. They're, they're in this culture where we're hearing about euthanasia and infanticide and gender, transgender, LGBTQ, male, female restrooms, creation, evolution, gay marriage, abortion, polygamy, pedophilia. I mean, who knows what to believe? And how can our children be no longer 
tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. We don't want them to be tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, uh, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. How, how can we stop them being tossed to and fro? You know, I think about that in regard to our own children. We have five children, four of them are married, and we have 17 grandchildren. Actually, we have 18 grandchildren because we have another one on the way. And so that is number 18. And we look at those, my wife and I often look at our grandchildren and, and we think, what sort of world are they growing up in? And they're in this culture where we see this horrible uh, tornado of moral relativism and how do they know what to believe? What can we do? Well, when we think about it, what can we do? We need to first of all understand what happened. And what happened began in a garden 6,000 years ago. When God created the first man, Adam, and he said to Adam, you can eat of all the trees of the garden. There's one tree you're not to eat of because if you do, you'll surely die. In other words, think about it. What God said was, obey my word, Adam. I'm the creator. I am, I am God. Obey God's word. But then what happened? We know the devil in the form of a serpent came to the first woman, Eve, and said, did God actually say? I want you to make note there. Do you know what the first attack was? The first attack was on the authority of the word of God. It's interesting. When you go to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, we read, beware. In other words, here's a warning for you. Uh, Just as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In other words, the devil's going to use the same method on us, on our children, on our grandchildren, the same method that he used on Eve. And what was that method? Did God really say? In other words, to create doubt in regard to the word of God. And that doubt will lead to unbelief. Remember back to what I said about the research we did on the young people who are moving away from the church. And when our researchers asked them, why did you leave? It came down to they had all these questions, all these doubts because of what they were taught about science. And what we find is most churches haven't taught apologetics, haven't taught them how to answer all those skeptical questions and defend the Christian faith and how they know there's a God, how to get the animals on the ark. What about evolution? Did did we really come from ape-like creatures? You know, can you really believe there was a global flood? Is there any evidence for a flood? And what about all the supposed evidence for the Big Bang and evolution and so on? instead of giving them those answers most churches have ignored all that and said oh you can just you know as long as you trust in Jesus it doesn't matter what you believe about those other things but it does matter because it creates that doubt but the Bible says how how can we trust that and that doubt leads to unbelief puts them on a slippery slide of unbelief through the whole of scripture and notice what else here you will be like God you can become your own God and you know because Adam and Eve succumbed and ate the fruit and so with Adam sin came into the world and death is a result of sin means our sin nature is that we would rather believe man's word than God's word and we want to be our own God that's our propensity because of our sin nature we want to determine right and wrong for ourselves and so what happened back there in the garden 6,000 years ago was a battle between God's word and man's word and that battle has raged ever since it's the same battle today the battle is not any different that's the thing it's always been the same battle a battle between God's word and man's word think about it's portrayed in different ways throughout scripture it's a battle between those who build a house on the rock those who build a house on the sand uh, between light and darkness those who gather those who scatter between those who trust the fountain of living waters or those who trust the broken cisterns of man As Psalm 118, verses 8 to 9, I read, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. It's that battle between God's word, man's word, that we see over and over again through Scripture. And you see, I want to challenge us. Do we really understand what it means that this is the word of God? that the Bible is the word of God. Do our children understand? Do our young people at at church, do, do, do our congregations really understand? Do we really understand what it means that this is the word of God? Because today I, I just get the feeling a lot of people look on the Bible as more a book of spiritual things, moral things, relationships. It's sort of a guidebook to life. But if this is what it claims to be, 
the word of God who knows everything, who's always been there, and he's revealed to us what we need to know to understand this universe and who we are and what it's all about, then it means that this has to be the foundation for our entire worldview. It's not just a book about spiritual things, moral things, relationships. This is the word of God that's the foundation for our entire worldview. You see, when we start with God's word, we build a way of thinking. You can call it putting on biblical glasses. We have the foundation that God's revealed to us, the history concerning a perfect creation and the entrance of sin and death and the flood of Noah's day, the Tower of Babel, all these events of history going through, you know, the call of Abraham and so on, leading up to the virgin birth, the message of the cross, the resurrection, the new heavens and new earth to come. We're given all this history that's the foundation for building the right worldview, putting on the right sort of glasses. So when we look at this world and we see all this death and suffering and we see fossils and we see all these different people groups, we already have revealed to us the history that enables us to correctly interpret what we're seeing. And you see, if you don't start from God's word, there is only one other foundation, and that is man's word. It's man who wasn't there, who doesn't know everything, who determines how to think about this universe. And on the basis of man's word, you build a whole different way of thinking. And man's word is there's no God. Everything came about by natural processes. And so therefore, over time, as, as we supposedly evolved, and so therefore morality evolved and that sort of thing. And so as you then go out and you put on man's glasses and you look at the world, oh, death and suffering has always been here over millions of years. Fossils were laid down over millions of years. We're just animals. We're just higher animals than the apes because, you know, we have more cognitive skills than they do and so on. And, of course, it also means when you die, you're done. That's what Bill Nye said to me when I debated him on this very stage. When you die, you're done. In other words, that's the end of you, which means there's no ultimate purpose and meaning in life anyway, so what's the point of living anyway? But from the foundation of God's word, when you die, we have souls that are, that are made in the image of God. We're going to live forever, but we'd be separated from God forever because of our sin. But that's why God sent his son to die on the cross, be raised from the dead. For those who put their faith and trust in him will spend forever with him a whole different view of what's going to happen in the future. You see, the problem that I think we've got in the church, or one of the problems, a major problem, is that the majority of our kids have gone to the government education system where, by and large, they've thrown God out, the Bible out, prayer out, creation out. They now teach that you can explain the whole of reality by natural processes that... Man determines what's right and what's wrong. And so we're seeing, you know, the, the, the whole uh, agenda of the LGBT movement permeating our education system. And, of course, that, you know, you've got, you've got to believe in abortion and you do whatever you want with sex. And, and so what we're seeing is generations who are coming out of that system with the foundation, it's man who determines truth. And when they go to church, often what we're trying to do is to take the Christian worldview and sort of put it on top of that foundation. In other words, oh, we're going to tell you about marriage and about Jesus and so on. But if you try to put it on that foundation, it doesn't work. And what will happen eventually is those that have that foundation will develop a whole different worldview, a secular worldview. And what do we notice today? Generations brought up in the church that... that Many of them are no longer going to church and they have a really secular worldview. So what can we do? I want to challenge us that what we need to be doing in our homes, in our churches, is this. Two particular aspects I want to emphasize. We need to be teaching people to be thinking foundationally. Psalm 11.3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? I just want to apply this in a particular way, talking about foundations. You see... If you want to build a house, you can't start with the roof and then the walls and then try to put a foundation under it. It doesn't work. You've got to start with the right foundation and then build the walls and then build the roof. In other words, for Christians to build the house, we need to start with God's word 
to then build the walls and the roof, the doctrines, to understand the gospel, the Christian worldview that comes out of this foundation. Now, we do that at the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter in different ways. At the Creation Museum, we walk people through what we call the seven seas of history. We have all these exhibits that enable you to understand this and to experience it. So it's great for kids as well as for adults and even for little kids. So you walk through this history of a perfect creation. Then corruption entered, sin and death entered. That's why there's death and suffering in the world because we rebelled against God. It's not God's fault, it's our fault. Death hasn't been here for millions of years. It's an intrusion, it's an enemy, as the Bible says. And then there was a global flood. If there was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. In other words, that explains most of your fossil record. And then there was an event of the Tower of Babel where people were of one language. And in Genesis 10 and 11, we read about this. And God gave different languages because they'd rebelled against him again, forcing people to move away from each other, families to move away from each other according to their language groups, developing all these different cultures we see around the world, but helping us understand we're all one race. We're all equal before God. We all have the same problem. Sin all need the same solution, Jesus Christ. And then... Those events of geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology are actually foundational to the rest of the Bible, those four C's there, because that's the, the, the cosmology, the anthropology, the geology, the astronomy that's foundational to our doctrine, to our worldview, to the gospel. And then, of course, following through in the Garden of Eden, God promised a savior when man rebelled. He promised a, a way for man to come back to be with God, and I'll go through that in a little bit here. And so we follow that history through and through all that's happened and all the wars and all the people moving about all over the earth and all that was going on, God preserved the seed promised in Genesis 3.15. And so God steps into history 2,000 years ago in the person of his son to be Jesus Christ, the God man, dying on a cross, raised from the dead. And one day there will be new heavens and new earth to come. And think about this. All this has happened in history. That's all happened. And we're somewhere here right now. So we're getting towards the end of time. We don't know when that will be because God is long-suffering. It's not his will that any should perish, it says in 2 Peter 3. And so we don't know when that will be. It could be at any time. But we do know that all this in history here has already happened. And the problem is we've had generations raised up who believe that this history concerning creation, corruption, catastrophe, and confusion is not true, or you don't need to believe it, or it doesn't matter. And a lot of times I find in the church, uh, Christian leaders will say, well, trust in Jesus, you know, believe the gospel. This part doesn't matter. But you see, if you don't have this foundational history, then you have no basis to deal with marriage, no basis to deal with racism, no basis to deal with abortion, no basis to help people understand the gospel. Why do I say that? Well, I want to give you some practical examples to help us understand that. And what I want to do is to use apologetics and thinking foundationally. Apologetics, 1 Peter 3.15, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. Always be prepared to make a defense or answer. The word defense or answer comes from the Greek word apologia, from which we get a word apologetics. It's one thing to tell people to trust the Bible. It's another thing to also equip them with apologetics. In other words, when questions are asked, and I've traveled all over the world for the past 40 plus years, I've traveled all over the world. And whenever people hear that I'm on about the Bible or Christianity, it doesn't matter what country I'm in, they ask questions. Questions like, well, wait a minute, don't we live in a scientific age? Hasn't science disproved the Bible? I mean, how do you know the Bible is true? What evidence is there for God? Who made God? Do you believe in Adam and Eve? Where did Cain get his wife? How did all the races come about if there were only two people to start with? Where's the evidence of the flood? Don't fossil layers prove millions of years in ev evolution? We know men evolved from ape-like creatures. How could the story of Adam and Eve be true? How can you believe in a loving God with all the death and suffering in the world? Didn't dinosaurs live millions of years ago and evolved into birds? How could Noah fit the animals on the ark? Hasn't science proved evolution is true? Isn't the Bible an outdated book of mythology? If you stand back and think about it, we've all heard those sorts of questions. In fact, that's true all around the world in this era. 
But you know, in many instances we hear him and say, well, don't worry about that, just trust in Jesus. No, we need to worry about that because when you don't answer those questions and show people you can defend your faith, you don't show your children and, and, and your grandchildren and equip them, that can cause doubt. That's what the devil can use to cause doubt. How can I trust the Bible? Because you can't answer those questions. How could any of this be true? I'm walking away from it. And then the other aspect is not just teaching apologetics, biblical and creation apologetics, but teaching to think foundationally. Thinking foundationally and teaching apologetics. What do I mean by thinking foundationally? Helping them understand that we all have a foundation for our worldview. If we have the wrong foundation of the wrong worldview, we've got to have the right foundation of God's word to have the right worldview. And so let me run through the seven C's, so to speak, and just give you examples of how we teach apologetics and how we teach people to think foundationally. Because this is how I believe we should be teaching in our churches and Sunday schools and our youth groups and Bible studies and Bible schools and, and seminaries and Bible colleges and so on. One of the most asked questions I've been asked all around the world is how could Noah fit all the animals on the ark? And so we built a life-size ark, which is one and a half times the length of a football field and half the width of a football field, and it's built 15 feet off the ground, so it stands seven stories high. At the bow end, it's 10 stories high, 3.3 million board feet of timber. It's a massive structure. And we have exhibits in all three decks that you walk through. But on deck one, we have an exhibit showing a cutaway ark and talking about how many kinds of animals are actually needed on the ark. Because, see... The way the secular world puts it today, Noah couldn't fit all the species of animals on the ark. That's what Bill Nye said to me on this stage. Millions of species of animals were needed on the ark, and he mocked and scoffed because I believed in Noah's ark. You know, the Bible says that God made kinds of animals. Kinds. Now, the word kind comes from a Hebrew word, and we need to look at what that word kind means because not only do we see that word kind, an uh, English word translated from the Hebrew word, in Genesis 1, God made kinds of lands animals. After their kind, the implication is each kind produces its own kind. And then we meet the word kind again in Genesis 6 when two of each kind, seven pairs of some kinds, but of the land-breathing, uh, land-dwelling, air-breathing animals to go on board the ark. And so what does that word kind mean? We have a classification system, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Well, we would say in the majority of instances that the word kind, translated from the Hebrew word mean, is more at the family level of classification, not species, not genus, but mainly family. Now, not always, but in the majority of instances. For instance, if you take the dog family, there's one dog family, but we can show that all those different species of dogs in the dog family in some way are connected. You can actually document this species bred with that one, that one with this one, this one with that one, that one with this one, this one never bred with that one, but it bred with that one, they bred with that one, they bred with that one, if you get the idea. And so when you can show that, then they're all the one kind. And we did all that research for all the kinds of land animals to see how many kinds were actually needed on the ark. And that's why at that exhibit at the ark, we say 1,398 animal kinds at the most. Now, that's actually overestimating because sometimes we think there are, there are some animals that are probably in the same kind, but we haven't documented them into breeding, so we allow them to be separate. And when it comes to fossils, they don't breed, they're dead. And so we allow some of them to be different kinds when they're probably the same kind. We think in actuality it's probably less than 1,000 animal kinds. But for the sake of argument, uh, 1,400 kinds, which means there's plenty of room on the ark. And so when it comes to dogs, you only needed two of the dog kind. That's what it says, two of each kind of the unclean and seven pairs of the clean. So two dogs on Noah's ark. Now they come off the ark, and then what happens? Well, you see, we have information in our genes that God has already put there. And just to give you a sort of a basic example here, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of these genes and there are millions and millions of combinations. But you probably learn at school about uh, genes and you have dominant genes, recessive genes, big A, little A, big B, little B, big C, little C. As I said, thousands and thousands of those. And so got enormous numbers of uh, combinations. But 
if that represents a male dog and a female dog, you can see from these two, sexual reproduction, one set of genes from the male, one from the female, and then you get all these different combinations. So they're all going to look a little different to each other because they've got these different combinations. And so over time, what happens? You produce more and more dogs, and then as they move away from each other, you'll find that over time, certain combinations survive better in some areas and other areas. Maybe the combination giving you longer hair survives better in colder areas and shorter hair and hotter areas and so on. And so you develop the different species. And that can happen very, very quickly because all the genetic information was already there. God put it there at the beginning. See, evolutionists believe that can't happen because for them, they have to start with no life and matter somehow generates this information. Uh, some matter somehow has to produce this DNA molecule and has to produce a language system to read the information. And over time, you've got to add in all this new information. We've never seen matter produce one bit of information. And so we then start to understand, of course, speciation is not evolution. And you can easily fit all the kinds of land animals on the ark. See, we need to be giving them answers, giving our kids answers, grandkids answers. Otherwise, they'll start to doubt and disbelieve the word of God. When it comes to issues like gender, when we start from God's word, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So if we start from the foundation of God's word, there are two genders. Scientifically, there are two genders. Because we know that you have the sex chromosomes in male, you have an X and Y chromosome, and a female, an XX uh, chromosome. And th those chromosomes determine whether you're male or female. XY chromosomes, male. XY, XX chromosomes, you are female. And so the Bible makes it clear, there are only two genders. Of course, get ready for what the secular world says. They'll say, oh, but wait a minute, there are exceptions. And by the way, there are exceptions, very small. For instance, here's an example. According to a study of 171,000 plus people, uh, chromosome abnormalities involving the sex chromosomes are one in 1,439, which equals 0.06%. So you do have some exceptions because of problems in the sex chromosomes. But we would say, as Christians, that that's because sin has affected the world. And so there can be mistakes in chromosomes. Actually, there's a lot of genetic disorders because of mistakes in our genes. And you can see a list of just some of them there. So it's the Bible's foundation of a once perfect world, but now fallen, that's why we have problems, that enables us to explain the so-called exceptions. But it's the foundation of God's word that enables us to understand there are only two genders, male and female, and actually observational science confirms that. You see, when you start from God's word, we're building that Christian worldview. We can do that for abortion. Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. So we were created in God's image. No animal was created in God's image. Only human beings were created in God's image. Remember, Adam was to name the animals and he did that for a purpose that God had for him to see that he was alone. There was no mate for him. That's why God made a woman for him from his side. Now, God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. So in sexual reproduction, you get DNA from the mother, DNA from the father, fertilization. There's a fertilized egg. And when that egg is fertilized, then all the information that builds you as a human being is there. No new information is ever added as that cell divides. So you are 100% you, because there's no more information added, at fertilization, 100% human, which means 100% made in the image of God, which means abortion is what? Killing a human being made in the image of God. So there's some apologetics in that we're, we now know something about DNA and fertilization, but we also know from God's word that human beings are made in the image of God. And so you put all that together and you have a foundation for helping your children and grandchildren have a truly Christian worldview when it comes to the abortion issue. You know, it's interesting. I was speaking on that here at the Creation Museum uh, one day and 
a, a young lady came to me afterwards. She was a teenager, I'd say in her late teens. And she looked at me with tears in her eyes and she said, what if someone like me has had an abortion? She said, I was brought up in the church all my life and nobody ever explained to me about being made in God's image and we're different to the animals and nobody explained that to me at all. Uh, nobody explained to me about DNA and, and that one set from the father, one from the mother. So, so a fertilized egg is not a woman's body. No, it's not. When you hear today people saying a woman has a right to do with her body what she wants, a fertilized egg is not her body. It's DNA from the man and DNA from the woman. In fact, your body wants to reject it as a foreign object, but God built an anti-rejection mechanism into the uterus. You know, if you have a kidney transplant, your body wants to reject it because it's a foreign body. Well, that's true of a fertilized egg because it's a unique combination of, of, of information. It's the, the combination of information, the DNA, is different to the mother and different to the father because it came from the mother and the father, unique individual. And she looked at me and she said, what if someone like me has had an abortion? I was never taught any of that. And I said, you know, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to give us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He removes our sins as far as the east is from the west and he promises to remember them no more. And she looked at me with a big smile on her face and said, thank you. You see, starting from God's word, we're building a Christian worldview about abortion. We do the same about marriage. The Bible tells us that God made man from dust and he said it's not good that man should be alone so he brought the animals to Adam to name and he saw there was none like him and so what did God do? He put Adam to sleep and from his side made the first woman and when Adam saw the first woman he said this is at last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she'll be called woman because she was taken out of man, she didn't come from an ape woman and man didn't come from an ape man man from dust woman from his side can't add evolution to the bible and then we read in genesis 2 24 therefore a man shall leave his father his mother hold to his wife and they shall be one flesh in other words therefore marriage this is the creation of marriage right here when god made a man from dust and a woman from his side in fact in matthew 19 jesus god's son the god man jesus christ on earth when asked about marriage said and and mark 10 we read the same basic quote have you not read in other words the authority of the word he which created them from the beginning made them male and female in other words there's only two genders and said therefore shall a man of his father and mother hold fast to his wife and there'll be one flesh that's genesis 127 and genesis 224 meaning genesis 1 and 2 aren't two different accounts of creation because here jesus is talking about the same one man and same one woman genesis 1 is an overview he made the male and female genesis 2 most of genesis 2 are the details of the creation of man and woman and so how he made man how he made woman and so what jesus is saying is the foundational history there as recorded in Genesis is the foundation for marriage. Marriage is to be a man and a woman. By the way, not just marriage, ultimately every single biblical doctrine of theology directly or indirectly is founded in Genesis 1 to 11. Sin, Genesis 1 to 11. Death, Genesis 1 to 11. Why did we wear clothes? Genesis 1 to 11. Marriage, Genesis 1 to 11. Why did Jesus die on a cross? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we need a new heavens and new earth? Genesis 1 to 11. You see, Genesis is the foundation. In fact, Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for the rest of the Bible and God's word is the foundation for our entire Christian world view. And so as we go through those seven C's, creation, corruption, the, the next C, the entrance of sin and death. You know, it's one of the big questions today. How can you believe in a loving God with all this death and suffering? In fact, I've, I've even heard in recent times of some famous person or a musician or someone who comes out and says, I don't believe in God anymore. And they usually bring up this issue of death and suffering. How can there be a God? Look at all the death and suffering. You look at all... The, the terrorism that's occurring around the world and even within nations like the United States and wh where's God? How can there be all this death and suffering? But see, the Bible tells us originally there was no death and suffering. It was a very good world. It was perfect. It was good as God describes good. But what happened? Remember, Adam, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Adam rebelled, sin came into the world and death as a consequence of sin. 
You see, death is an enemy. That's what the Bible says. One day death will be thrown to the lake of fire. One day there will be new heavens and new earth. Will there be no more death or suffering or disease? It will be a restoration, it says in Acts, which means put back to what it was like originally. But you see, if you believe in millions of years as a Christian, it's always been death and suffering and, and disease and horrible things. But the Bible says, no, it's our sin that caused a change. We're living in a fallen while a groaning world, it says in Romans 8. You know what happened when Adam sinned? God made garments of skins and clothed Adam and Eve. Garments of skins, which means he must have killed animals, the first blood sacrifice, the covering for their sin, a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We know that Genesis 3.15, looking back at that now, is really the gospel and God promising a saviour. And here in Genesis 3.21, setting up the sacrificial system, and really it's the promise of the Savior. Of course, the Israelites sacrificed animals over and over and over again. We don't sacrifice animals today. Why? Because the perfect sacrifice has come. But you see, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, and the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so in Adam, we forfeited our right to live so our bodies will die but our soul is made in the image of God will live forever but we're separated from God but God wants us to spend forever with him and provides a way for us to spend forever with him and so without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins the Bible says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sin and so therefore the the sacrifice of animals was really pointing to the fact that one day someone would come who would be the ultimate sacrifice because a man brought sin and death into the world. A man would have to pay the penalty for sin and death. An animal can't. That was only a symbol of the one who would. And it would have to be a perfect man, which means it can't be any one of us, but it has to be one of us because we're all descendants of Adam. So what did God do? He stepped into history to be one of us, to be the God-man, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead to conquer death and offers a free gift of salvation. Wow. You see, if you believe that there was millions of years of death and struggle before man sinned, then what does it mean without the shedding of blood? There's no remission of sins when there would have been the shedding of blood millions of years before sin. Not only that, if you believe in millions of years as a Christian, I want to challenge you. I'm not saying you're not a Christian, but I want to challenge you. In the fossil record, there's lots of examples of animals eating each other, bones in their stomachs. Well, the Bible says originally Adam and Eve and the animals were vegetarian. In fact, we as humans weren't told to eat meat until after the flood. If you believe in millions of years as a Christian, in the fossil record, there's lots of examples of diseases like cancer and arthritis and abscesses. This is a very recent one. Cancer seen in humans also found in a supposed 66 million year old dinosaur fossil. If all these diseases existed in the fossil record, Millions of years before man sinned and after God made man, he said everything was very good. Everything he made was very good. Then we're saying God calls cancer very good. No, 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 no. This is a fallen world. There wasn't millions of years of death, suffering and disease leading up to man. Death, suffering and disease is a consequence of our sin. That's why we've got to help our children uh, understand this is not the world as God made it. It was a perfect world, but now it's all falling apart and all these horrible things because we sinned against God. And by the way, if this is true, it means the fossil record could not have been laid down millions of years before man. Is there any event in the Bible that could explain how the fossil record could be formed? Wow. What about the next sea, catastrophe, the flood of Noah's day? If there really was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. And you know what you find? Exactly that. Most of your fossil record is actually the record of the flood. With all these billions of dead things we see all over the earth. And then as the flood ended, the ark landed. There were eight people on the ark. They came out of the ark and increased in number. And they rebelled against God again. And so God gave them different languages, causing them to move away from each other from the event of the Tower of Babel. We don't have different races of people. We're all one race. 
In fact, when the Human Genome Project mapped the human genome, they said, guess what we found? There's only one race. Of course there's only one race. Different people groups, but one race. Two races spiritually, but one race biologically. And actually, did you know we're all the same skin color? We have a pigment called melanin. And melanin is a brown pigment. And if you have a lot of the brown pigment, you can look very dark. A little bit of the brown pigment, you can look very light. But it's just due to genetic variation. That's all it is. In fact, if big A, big B mean a lot of melanin, little A, little B mean a little bit of melanin, eventually, if you end up with groups that only have big A's and big B's, they're only going to have dark-skinned people. Or if you end up with groups that only have little A's and little B's, you're only going to have light-skinned people. It's very easy to understand because, you see, uh, in the outer layer of our skin, uh, we actually have uh, structures that produce the pigment melanin. And if your genes, say, produce a lot of melanin, then my grace to the surface, you'll be darkly pigmented. If you, uh, these structures uh, produce only a little bit of melanin, and these structures are called melanosomes, uh, and you will only be lightly uh, pigmented. That's very easy to understand. But the point is, we're all one race. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. We're all sinners. We're all equal before God. Different people groups, but there's two races spiritually, the saved and the unsaved. And we want to see our children, grandchildren, everyone in the saved race, which is why we need to be teaching them God's word and the gospel. And so what I was doing was teaching you apologetics, showing how in biology, geology, uh, anthropology, biochemistry, and we only just glanced over it, but to give you a big picture. And of course, you could go into all of these in much more detail showing that it, all of this really confirms the Bible's history. Biology, kinds, yes. Uh, dogs produce dogs. They produce after their own kind. And you, you could easily fit the kinds of land animals on the ark. You didn't need all the species. And geology, yeah, most of your fossil records are a result of the flood. Yeah, All the different races, no, they're not. They're, they're all one race, just different people groups. And God had already put that genetic variability in our, in our genes there so that as people moved away from each other, you get different combinations of genes forming different people groups, but we're much more closely related than we think. And when we look at DNA, it helps us understand about, yes, God put all that genetic variation there to start with. And also, humans are humans. And so it goes on. And then thinking foundationally. When we start from God's word, we build this truly Christian worldview. So when we have generations of kids that are anchored in God's word, then as this tornado of moral relativism rips around them, they're not going to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, because if they know what they believe, why they believe what they do, they know their foundation, and uh, they've, they've committed their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we've equipped them with those answers, they will stand firmly and boldly and courageously and contend for the faith. You know, the bottom line, there's been a battle ever since the beginning. It's the same battle going on today. Two foundations, God's word, man's word. From God's word, there's one race, man's word, different races of people because we evolved at different times from ape-like creatures. God's word, marriage is a man and a woman. Man's word, marriage is whatever you want to make it to be. From God's word, gender, there's only two, male and female. Man's word, you can, you can decide if you're a male or female. It doesn't matter biologically what you are. You can just decide whatever you want to be. From God's word, abortion, killing a human being made in the image of God. Man's word, you're just an animal. It doesn't matter. And when we raise up generations that no longer have the foundation of God's word, we will see the collapse of Christian morality and increasing moral relativism, which is exactly what we're seeing in our culture. In fact, look at it this way, two castles. The foundation of man's word, notice sand, God's word, rock. And this is the secular worldview, comes out of man's word, moral relativism, as we see here. God's word, now, God's word, we need to understand Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundational history for the rest of the Bible, and the whole Bible is the foundation for our Christian worldview, and now that comes the Christian worldview and our doctrines. And you see, here's the battle. The devil knows. How do you attack Christianity? Well, go back to Genesis 3. Did God really say? 
In other words, create doubt in regard to the word of God. And in this era of history, there's been an incredible amount of doubt created in regard to Genesis 1 to 11. Even many of our leaders in our churches have said, you don't need to believe Genesis 1 to 11 and have added evolution and millions of years in and said, don't worry about that. There's been an incredible attack on Genesis 1 to 11. Much of the church has undermined their own foundation by not believing Genesis 1 to 11. And then we look over here and say, look at all the problems in our culture. That's what we've got to deal with. You know, gay marriage, abortion, racism, all these problems. But they're not the problems. They're the symptoms. Do you realize that racism, abortion, gay marriage, the gender issue, they're all the same problem? In fact, think about that in regard to the riots that we've seen in America in recent times. And people are horrified to see cities being burned and rioters and looters and just the, the absolute devaluing of human life where they don't care if they, they kill somebody and uh, don't care about people's property and just go out and do whatever is right in their own eyes. Because you see, this is a symptom of a deeper problem. That's what we need to understand. It's a symptom of a deeper problem. You see, when we look at these castle diagrams once again, one of the things I want us to understand is this. How should Christians deal with all these issues? Because what's happening in America in regard to the looting and, and the writing that's going on, and people say it's because of the race issue. No, no, that's a symptom of a deeper problem. Right? The abortion issue is a symptom of a deeper problem. The gay marriage is a symptom of a deeper problem. What's happened is this that we've had generations raised up on this foundation of man's word and they use any excuse they can now to do whatever is right in their own eyes. They're their own gods. They can do what is right and what is wrong. And, and there's this sense of ultimately no purpose and meaning. Why shouldn't I do what I want? Go out there and kill, take from others. doesn't really matter. We've had generations who have been raised up in our whole Western world with the foundation that it's man who determines truth. It doesn't matter whether it's Canada, Australia, the United Kingdom, America. We've all got the same foundational problem. And how do we deal with it? Well, as we raise up generations who know what they believe, know why they believe what they do, can defend the Christian faith and know that you've got to fight the battles foundationally. In other words, the battle is not up here at, the, at this level of these issues. The battle's down here. We need to get generations to understand they've got the wrong foundation. And then we can deal with these issues up here. But what I'm saying is it's a foundational problem. It's a foundational battle. It's that battle between God's word and man's word. And, you know, once you have generations who have been raised up in a godless situation and indoctrinated against God's word and have the wrong foundation of sand on which they build their thinking. You know, it is, it is a very difficult job to be able to turn things around, but we need to understand something. We're told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're told to contend for the faith. We're told to give reasons for what we believe. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead. Now I sort of look on it like Jesus coming to the tomb of Lazarus. Move the stone away. But Jesus could have done that with a word. Yeah, but you, can, you do that. You move away the stone. And then what man can't do, Jesus did. He raised the dead by his word. And that's really what I'm saying. That we're to be out there moving away the stone, giving those answers, raising up generations equipped to defend their faith and having those answers to be able to give to people uh, in, in regard to geology and biology and astronomy and anthropology. We can't prove to them the Bible is true. What we can do is give them answers and point to the fact that the Bible is true. And then present to them the gospel so that God would raise the dead. That's really what the battle is all about. And churches need to stop compromising God's word and stop all, all this shallow teaching and all this entertainment philosophy and raise up generations on the foundations of God's word who know what they believe, know why they believe what they do, equipped with answers to defend the Christian faith so they'll stand with boldness and courage. Well, you know what? 
One of the things we do is supply resources around the world. It doesn't matter whether you're in Canada or whether you're in Africa or whether you're in China, it doesn't matter where you are. Answers TV, answers.tv is our streaming service and it's at a very, very nominal price uh, so that people around the world can afford it. I encourage you to go there for your seven day free trial. We're putting more and more of our speakers from other countries like Canada and other places up on answers.tv. Uh, we have Spanish programs, we're putting up Arabic programs, we have programs from other famous uh, great preachers of the word like Ray Comfort. It's a phenomenal streaming service. Uh, it's sort of like, the, it's Christian equivalent to Netflix. Well, you know, Netflix is, well, we won't talk about Netflix, but answers.tv. And then basic books I encourage you all to get. And you can order them from within Canada. You can order them from within the United Kingdom, Australia, the United States, because we have offices in all those uh, countries. My book, The Lie, that's really what I talked about today. That message in much more detail. That's really the whole book of our ministry. Other than the Bible, the Bible is the textbook of our ministry. I would say get The Lie. That's the textbook of our ministry in regard to really what we teach at Anson Genesis Creation Museum and the Ark Account and challenge the church to believe God's word starting in Genesis. Gospel Reset, how to evangelize a culture that's changed foundation. We've, we've, we're now seeing a secular culture. You can't go out and present the gospel the same way we've done in the past. The gospel hasn't changed, but how you present it does because we no longer have generations who have a respect for the Bible we have the right foundation. So you've got to begin foundationally. And I compare the presentation of the gospel for those in Acts 2 and those in Acts 17. And then these five books, the five answers books, answers books one to four and five of evidence, 160 of the most asked questions that we have today with detailed answers. And most of the questions you're going to get are answered in there. And those seven books I'll call the core books of our ministry that I encourage every one of you to get. Also, Glasshouse, the major classic arguments for evolution, millions of years and so on, used in the government schools and secular education, refuted. And this is a more detailed book on one race, one blood, one dealing with the six days of creation. This is an introductory apologetics program, 12, 30-minute programs of mine uh, with a study guide that goes with them. It's great for teenager upwards. Actually, I'd say 10, 11-year-old upwards as a course on uh, apologetics. And then One Blood for Kids. We have Dinosaurs for Kids, Dinosaurs for Little Kids, and Answers Books for Kids. Uh, they, they've got the same questions. Kids have the same questions the teenagers do and the adults do. And so we answered them. We had kids writing their real questions and put them in this pack here, the answers books for kids. Rhyme books for little kids, like A is for Adam. There's others as well. We have a four-year Sunday school curriculum. Many homeschoolers are using it as a homeschool curriculum. It's unique in the world, apologetics, biblical authority, chronological. There's no other curriculum like this in the entire world. And we'll have a full digital version available uh, as well. It's an absolutely incredible, powerful program. Answers Magazine, encourage you all to subscribe. It's like a, a survival tool for families and churches today as we instruct you uh, to be able to defend the faith as a, a kid's section in a kid's magazine and has the print magazine and the digital edition as well. Go to answersandgenesis.org and you'll be able to select Canada as your country or the United Kingdom, or Australia, or the United States, and obtain those materials, look at our website, thousands of articles there, sign up for answers.tv, encourage you to do that, and also get the resources, and let's start raising up generations, knowing what they believe, why they believe what they do, and teaching them apologetics and to think foundationally, so we will have people who will be a shining light for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.